Hello, arty peoples, and welcome to another episode of Jerry's Live. My name is Emmy Klein, and I'm your host this evening. And today's class is going to be all about painting roses, specifically uh, this image, actually. Uh, I will go through the step-by-step -step of how to achieve this and uh, kind of how to also experiment uh, later on with a variety of colors and different brush marks. So uh, if you are interested in any of the items that I'm going to be showing you today, make sure to go to the website jerrysartorama.com and in the top search bar, type in today's class code, which I believe is down here. I'll end up moving this so it's not uh, in the way. But the, the class code is right here uh, and it'll be up all throughout the show. And it is JL228. So if you type in JL228 in the search bar, our teacher cart should come up with everything that we're going to be covering. And then you guys can shop that way or check it out a little bit more in detail. Uh, but let's jump in. Oh, I do apologize. Quick reminder uh, <laughs> is that our 10th annual self portrait contest is still happening, guys. So if you are trying to participate in our 10th annual self-portrait contest make sure you start painting yourself or whatever media that you work in and uh, our lovely moderators Amanda and Frida will put the links in for you guys to check that out so um, now we can jump in so uh, essentially let's go over the quick basic uh, stuff that we're gonna be using first and foremost we got brushes um, I am actually using a long handle brush which is better for an easel painting. So if you are painting at like an easel like this, this is kind of the, the way that you want to be working. Um, I happen to be grabbing a long handle brush instead of a short handle brush, um, just because I wanted this specific size and shape because this is, they're all filberts, just so you know. Uh, and I will go over different brush marks that you guys can get, but um, this is my personal favorite, so much so I have a tattoo of it on my foot. <laughs> but uh, they all are filberts and they're just different sizes. So I have a 20, I have a 12, and I have a 4. I also am supposed to have a 16, but I left that at home. So I'm going to just have to make do with what I got. <laughs> um, now besides that, the one that I did the example on is actually on the Centurion uh, LX uh, Universal Primed Canvas Panel. Now the materials that I'm going to be using on this is the Turner Crow Gouache. Now, the reason why I'm specifically going with a panel uh, or a Da Vinci panel, which is a cradled panel, and actually let me show you the back side of this. So it's solid panel. No, there's no flexibility to this, and I've already primed this for the show. Um, but this is the, the packaging, so you guys can see that. Um, but this is, again, it starts off white, the canvas panels, and I believe these come in a pack of three um, but I am specifically using a solid panel that does not have flexibility because of the paint I'm using uh, the Turner Cool Gouache is uh, not quite exactly a gouache it does not re-wet just so you guys do know but I do love how uh, flat the finish is there is no glare on this because there is no sheen it's a flat matte surface and I absolutely love it. It's really great for illustrations or if you want to scan this in and reproduce it as prints. Um, the other thing is that uh, I love how many colors they come in. There are so many. It's, it's insane, the amount. Uh, I think I've swatched all of them one time and I, it took me a very long time. <laughs> I think I ended up with a stack of colors about this big and they were each little tiny cards and it's just, there's so many. Um, but I'm using these specifically for that reason today. I don't want to mix our colors. So if there's anybody out there who has issues with mixing color, uh, this is a really fun project for you guys to be doing, uh, just especially to explore your brush strokes and kind of how to achieve this effect without having to actually mix anything. Um, so that's the panels that we're going to be using, and I actually will be starting off with a third option in case you guys wanted another one. Uh, this is actually the same size. These are both 6x6, six six, um, but this is the Centurion LX canvas panel. So this actually has canvas on the surface, and it has that texture of canvas. This, however, is the Da Vinci uh, dual-sided panel. So this has two sides that you can work on. One of them is ultra smooth, which is really, really cool. And the other side is a medium texture. Now, even this medium texture is not as rough as that canvas. And um, actually, we might be able to get a better view here uh, from the overhead, just so you guys can really see. 
let me pull this up here. You can actually really see the canvas texture showing through on this. If you want that, then this canvas panel is great. If you don't, the, the DaVinci Pro or uh, even the cradled panel is, because this is the ultra smooth surface as well um, that I have primed, uh, but this has that medium texture as well. And plus, if you don't like your painting, you can just flip it over and keep going on a new one. Um, but I like this cradle panel, and I did do this so you guys could see. Um, I primed this with the, the jet black, and it is so dark that it looks like a black hole here on the camera. <laughs> how cool is that? Uh, but this is how I actually wanted to start off the painting. So uh, the really cool thing, though, with this cradle is that you could paint the edge just a solid black and keep your artwork going over the edge or you can keep it that birch and kind of keep your marks tidy and you could even stain this because this is uh, raw wood and you can finish it with a stain or something else like a different color of paint if you wanted to. Um, so that's the panel we're going to be painting on but I did want to show you quickly how easy it is to get a panel primed. So let me grab, especially when you are uh, toning your canvas, especially if it's bigger like this one, uh, the one thing to do is to use a big brush. You don't want to sit there and try to cover this entire panel with this size brush. You are going to drive yourself crazy and it's just not going to be fun. So the last thing I have on the, the table here is just a bucket of water. The reason why I have water is because this Turner Curl Gouache, it is so concentrated. That's another reason why I really love this paint. So a little goes a long way. I'm going to squeeze out a little bit here because when you paint with this stuff, you can use it straight out the tube, but you most likely are going to want to do thinner washes by mixing it with water. So I have a wet brush, right? A little bit of water, just to kind of break it apart a little bit and make it a little bit more fluid. And that's probably too much paint for this entire panel, just so you know. Um, but the coverage on that is, it's crazy. So you just honestly, to start off your painting, we're gonna tone the entire thing jet black. Now I need a little bit more water. Now this is what I wanted to show you. If you do use, this is the ultra smooth surface, and you can see it's got a little bit of reflection because it's still wet right now, but you can see my brush marks on there. I'm not too worried to get that as solid black as possible. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get that first coat on and really, really get that first layer on there. So once I do this, I try to minimize my brush strokes by being really light and just, just pulling across the surface here. But if you have brush strokes, it's not the end of the world, you know? Because once this dries, it's gonna be a flat matte surface and then I do a second coat on that and then it's a solid black. So this is two coats and it's insane, the difference. Like you get the, the streaky, which is okay. So this is just a, a quick, easy way to tone your, your, can, your canvas surface. So if we do have any questions though, guys, make sure to pop it into the chat. Uh, Amanda and Frida will ask those questions as we go along because I'm going to be moving relatively quickly. And then um, they'll make sure to ask your questions while we're, we're going. So the other thing to note when you were painting roses is that, and you can see these kind of scattered around my table here, you guys can get real life re reference, you know? I got roses, oh, when did I get these? Like weeks ago? A week ago. It's been like a week, maybe week and a half, and they're still really pretty. Like this one didn't open up as much as this one did, so I'm probably would base my painting off of something like this, just because I want that nice, fluffy, beautiful rose. But this one, I really like the color of it. I also love that as it's kind of dying, uh, the edges of it are getting, I guess the only word I can think of is like crispy. It's, it's getting a little crispy and it's getting a little darker, which makes it kind of lend more into that purple than a red, but this is probably a little bit easier for you guys to see. So you guys can get your own reference, and I mean, I got these from the grocery store, so very easy to get your reference. Um, and side note, I'm doing this 
for Valentine's Day. <laughs> so instead of buying a dozen roses and giving them to my significant other, I'm gonna paint a dozen roses. That way they last forever, you know? Uh, the other thing that I was thinking about, side note, is that I wanted to have 11 of these and then I also wanted to have one where it was Betty White because she is the best golden girl, let's be honest. But it would be a dozen roses at that point with just a little extra pizzazz. <laughs> Uh, yes, we have a question. What size brush was it that you were using to tone your surface there? Um, I, it was the largest one that I have, which is the size 20. Yeah, it's a 20 filbert. Move that up a little, a little closer. There you go. What's the question? How long do you expect that first coat to take to dry? Uh, it's already, here, I can actually hold this up here. You can see it's already mostly dry. If you wanted to, you could hit this with a hair dryer, which I actually have, and it's actually very satisfying. I'm not going to be able to talk while you guys see this, but in case you wanted to see, let me get that glare on there to where you can see this. Let me, uh, there we go. Just like that, that little glare right there. Uh-oh. Did I lose power? I think it, I think it tripped itself. Uh-oh. Hold on. Hair dryers. There we go. Now we're back in business. No, it tripped again. Okay, well, I guess the hair dryer's out. Anyway, you guys could, if you wanted to, just hit this with a hair dryer. And if you do, you can actually see that shine right there will just slowly dissipate. And it's very satisfying to watch. But as you can see, it's already mostly dry. Um, so there's just a couple of wet spots. And then I would go in with a second coat. So this actually dries relatively quick, especially because I'm also breaking it down with some water and that water evaporates really fast. So, so do you think it dries faster than acrylics in general? Or the, about the same? That depends on the acrylic. Honestly, I can't, I can't say that for sure. Uh, and it also depends on where you are, the temperature of your studio, if you have humidity, all of those things. It's, it's very hard to say. I would say that this does dry a little bit faster than acrylics, but again, at the same time, this entire process that I'm about to show you is going to use very, very thin washes. So you're not blobbing it on really thick, so it doesn't have a whole lot of water and moisture to evaporate and then dry, which is actually the reason why I wanted to show you guys this process, because it's a very fast thing, and Valentine's Day is next week. So cough, cough, hint, hint. If you don't have a thing to give to your honey for Valentine's Day, this is a fast uh, way to do something that would be amazing and lovely and uh, you won't be late. <laughs> could you use black gesso to start if you wanted to? You could use black gesso. We also have the uh, Practica canvases that come already pre-primed black. Uh, the reason why I really love this uh, Turner Jet Black is that even black gesso is not as dark as this. It is just like, it's, I, I'm not joking, even in person, mm -hmm. it's like a black hole. It's so dark. It's like velvet, you know? Now, the other thing that I wanted to show you guys, if you didn't want to use just reference as like the roses that you can get, there are also so many different photos that you guys can work off of. This one right here is actually the one that I was basing this off of. Uh, and this is kind of the one I'm gonna, I'm gonna work off of this again so I can show you guys how to get to this. Um, we're just gonna do it a little bit bigger so you guys can see what I'm doing. <laughs> um, but there are so many photos out there of roses if you guys want to look it up. Uh, again, I, you guys, if you've watched the show, you know me, I love Pixabay and unsplash.com. Those are the two websites I usually use for um, royalty-free images. I'm knocking down all of my things over here, sorry. Uh, but those are the things that I usually do just to get my reference photos. So um, this is, I love the dramatic lighting of this. And it's just, it was so easy for me to be able to break down those shapes that I wanted to show you kind of how I did that. So, any other questions before I move on? I think we're probably all right. Okay, so I'm gonna put this little panel off to the side and I'm and actually, just so you guys do know, I usually would clean my water at this point, 
but I'm live on camera, so we're just going to switch it out <laughs> for some fresh clean water because I don't want that black to uh, affect my my red colors, uh, even though it doesn't affect it that much, and I have the other wells that I could use. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that I have nice, fresh, clean water. Um, so let's work off of this image, right? So I'm going to try and hopefully have this to where you guys don't get a crazy glare on it, but hopefully you guys can also see this. Um, I do know uh, Amanda and Frida can pop this link down for this image into the chat for you guys so you guys can see the actual image on your screen. My printout is still a little darker than it is on camera or like on your, your screen that you would see. So um, if you are working on something like this, you can tweak your photo reference to where you can brighten it up a little bit if you need to or you can darken it, whether, whatever it is that you need. Um, you can also take your own photo reference if you wanted to dramatically light a rose, you know, with a lamp or something that you have in your bedroom and turn off all your lights and do it at, dark, at uh, nighttime so everything else is just pitch black and dark and then you get kind of a similar effect, you know? But I wanted to show you the way that we're gonna do this. So let me put this here. Hopefully we can kind of work this way. Right, and oh, just so you guys do know, this is a, an easy wiper in case you were wondering. It's sponsored by easy wiper. I should, I should be sponsored by easy wiper. <laughs> I use them enough, you know? Uh, let's make sure that you guys can really see this. So here are the colors I'm going to be using. Now I also have white. I don't even know if I'm going to use this. I didn't use it at all in this painting, right? Um, so these are the ones that I used and I used them in a very specific order. So I went with aubergine was my first one. Then I went poppy red and then I went cadmium red light, which is a hue, uh, just so you guys do know. And then I have a coral red. So those are the colors and that's the order in which I lay it down. I don't mix it on my canvas. Uh, I don't mix it on my palette. I literally lay down chunks of color. So let's go through and quickly kind of show you how to do that. We're gonna start off with the aubergine, which is a lovely like purpley red, just like this, um, the label looks. It's this darker, kind of color back here. Uh, that's that aubergine. It's like a really just pretty purpley red. Now, I would also be using my 16 for this, which I did grab a 16 flat uh, just as a backup. I really want my filbert. But uh, just so you guys do know, also in case you weren't aware, the differences between a flat and a filbert, it's not a ton of difference. The filbert is just slightly rounded, whereas the flat is just straight flat. So I'm gonna actually stick with my filberts for right now, and I'm gonna go with my 12. And I'm gonna get it wet, and I'm gonna get that aubergine paint a little bit looser. We're looking for like a soupy consistency. You don't want like runny like it's water, but you want it like melted butter is a good consistency. Right, and then I'm going to break down the shape of my rose, right? Now, before I do this, let me actually, and I grab this so you guys can hopefully see a little bit better. I'm just gonna use a white paint marker so you guys can really see. And actually, maybe we should zoom in a little bit so you guys can really see this. Um, hopefully I'm more or less centered. <laughs> we'll adjust here where, as, we, as we need to. There we go. All right, and I have this at a slight angle, so hopefully that uh, glare will stay pretty down. Uh, try not to pop this into my puddle of aubergine. There we go, okay. So the way that I'm gonna break this down, and I'm gonna start in the center of my rose. So I'm going to really just break this down into big shapes of the petals, right? So anywhere where it's really dark, I'm gonna leave black. But like anywhere where I see that main shape, I'm going to paint that in aubergine, right? And I might even pull this back around and have it go kind of like that. But I'm gonna leave anywhere where I have that overlap, I'm gonna try and leave a little bit of space of that black to just kind of sparkle through, just to have that separation. 
Now, down here where you have those chunks of rose, uh, rose petals where it's all, all really relatively light, I'm going to paint that all as one big chunk, right? So I might paint this kind of like... Let me do this here. I might leave a little bit up there just to kind of differentiate the rose petals, right? And you can break this down as simply or as intricate as you want, but right now I'm just looking for big shapes, right? I also have a second printout so you guys don't have to deal with my lines. <laughs> and I'm dropping paint all over the place. Whoops. Making a mess. Very unlike me. All right, so I'm gonna start with the center of my rose and I wanna put the center of my rose kind of right in the middle, you know? So let me do a little bit, and I got a little bit of a glare on this thing for me. Real light, it's hard to see. There you go, you guys can see the kind of the reflection of that. So I want it really light because these are my shadow colors. All those rose petals that I can see in the very back, they're gonna be that really dark purple. So that will actually be relatively easy to push back into shadow, right? And let me do some quick, quick little petal so you guys can can really see as we go along. And here's the deal. If I don't follow this exactly, that's okay. I'm just using this as inspiration. It might not look perfect, but what I'm looking for are petal shapes. So the center is gonna be almost like little C shapes that are kind of back and forth like this. So that C shape, that C shape, that kind of a thing and they'll go back and forth. So if I use this brush, and that's the cool thing about this palette, is that if I need to, I can practice my brush strokes. Uh, uh, that's why I love a filbert, is because if I need to, and I get my, uh, and that's, you'll always see me kind of pull my brush like this uh, on the flat side, so where I have a big rounded shape, but I also, if I turn it sideways, I have a very pointy brush, so I can use that. I can use the pointy side and then I can turn it and then go that way and kind of flick it and, and alter my brush shapes. Now this is the other thing I wanted to show you because I also grabbed a, another variety of brushes. Uh, let me put that one back. We'll use these. Right here is the dagger striper and then we have a just a round brush. They also give you very different brush strokes. A filbert is my personal preference. You don't have to love a filbert. I'm not gonna require you to, you don't, it, it's not necessary. But a round brush can give you kind of a similar thing where you can start off real pointy and then you can give the pressure and then kind of pull it off and get that same kind of effect just using a different tool. If this works better for you, please use it. Um, now the dagger is a little bit different. This is a really fun brush to use. Um, so it, you can pull it and get really fine lines, just like the filbert. And then you can also really whip it around and the water is kind of making this beat up, but you can get really fun shapes. So use your different brushes, experiment with them and try to see which one works best for you. But that's kind of the shapes that we're going for. And pay attention to the, the different shapes that are inside your rows in your reference or in your actual rose that you have. So as you can see, except for that little chunk right there, this is dried and it's lightened up quite a bit. You can see it now, right? Which is pretty cool. So let me do a couple more of these petals. And once I start getting a little bit further out from the center, I'm gonna, cause it's back and forth along the same kind of edge. There's 
this way, then there's this way, then there's this way, then there's this way. Then it starts going back, back down and around. So that way I can start doing that once I get a little further out. And as you see, I can get it real pointy on this side and then pull it in. Then I can get it real pointy on this side and pull it in to meet that one. And then if I need to touch it up just a little bit, I can. But that is how I get those really pointy edges uh, along the, the little corners there and then get that really nice swoopy kind of a brush stroke. So do we have any questions while I'm doing these? Because I'm going to try and rush through these. Derek was asking how heavy that size 20 filbert brush is, if it's got a nice heavy hand feel. Um, it's not that heavy. It really, it doesn't have that much, that much weight to it. It's pretty light. Because, I mean, you don't want to fatigue your hand, because that's the, the reason why long handle brushes are great for, uh, especially if you're working at an easel. If you hold them back here at the end, the majority of the weight, like if you see that, like it's pretty balanced. Um, and I'm just, you know, wedging it in my palm and just holding it on my finger. Like it's relatively light. You want it to be pretty balanced like that, but you don't want it to be so heavy to where it makes your arm hurt. If you do like a heavier... Uh, brush. The one thing I have seen is, ha uh, I can't remember what kind of weights that they were using, but they had some kind of a cylinder weight that would go on here and they'd kind of tape it on and that would give you a little bit uh, more of a heft to it. Uh, but that's more of an attachment for your brush, you know. Alright. Now I'm going to use these smaller brushes as I paint my inner petals here. But as I move out and I start getting those bigger petals, you want to use the right tool for the job, right? So just like I wasn't using this tiny little brush to prime the whole surface, I'm not going to use this tiny little brush to try and paint that whole petal. I'm trying to do this in as little brush strokes as possible. And that's, that's really key. That's why you want to really practice your brush strokes, you know? So I'm going to go back to that 20. And I'm going to get that same purple. Load it up on my brush. And here, let me kind of scooch this down a little bit so you guys can see. Here's that, that consistency where you get, it's a little bit looser than straight out of the tube. But this stuff is so concentrated, you really don't need a whole lot. Like, it's... It's pretty loosey-goosey there, mixed with the water. So, let me do a couple more of these. Start off with my, my really fine spot. And so this is really, like, you gotta treat it like, a, almost like very graphic kind of a style. It's, there's not a whole lot of blending. Visually, it will blend with your, your, uh, your eye will blend it for you. So you really don't have to blend the colors, you know? Which is really cool. All right, now let me do this. There are even a couple of really, really thin petals right down here. You guys can see that. It's hard to see that glare. And plus that contrast of this rose is just so great that it's really hard to see on the camera. I hope it's picking it up. But there's just a couple little fine petals in there. And again, you can put it in if you want to. Oh, I got some fuzz that dropped there. But you don't have to put every little brush stroke in. Right? So I'm going to do just a couple more here just so we can get a couple of these petals, the outer petals is where the light is really hitting it, down here on the bottom. So I wanted to make sure to get those. So, let's do just maybe one more. That one, this one right here, is very pointy, so I'm going to try and mimic that. By making almost like a V shape. 
right. And the cool thing, and this is why this is a really great uh, kind of a practice painting for beginners, because we're not mixing, because let's be honest, I'm kind of a klutz sometimes, and I will drop paintbrushes on my actual artwork. It's not unknown, I just dropped it on the table over there. So right here, if you guys can see, I dropped the lighter color on that top rose, <laughs> and I did not mean to. <laughs> so the cool thing with these, this whole process, let me kind of clean off my brush here, is that if I mess up, I can take that jet black and I can go back in and I can clean it up if I need to. So there we go. I took out the part where I oopsied. Um, so that's the idea with any of these layers is that they're just chunks of shape, right? So if I mess up or if I don't like it, I can alter that shape very easily because I'm trying to paint very flat, right? Um, I might have some variation, like you can see variation in my brush strokes uh, that kind of going throughout the, the petals and that's just because of the way I was kind of pulling it. So if I do mess that up a little bit, I'm not, it's not the end of the world. Um, but if you're, you're trying to get kind of, like you can see it here, um, let me hopefully, yeah. You can see it there, where it got a little bit thinner, just there on the top. Now, I personally like that. If you want to paint it in one big, chunky, flat shape, that's great. You can. It's totally fine. Um, but to be able to fix your mistakes, this is why I'm doing it this particular way. So that the, the colors are very easily repainted. And that's the cool thing. Because this dries so fast, you can go back and forth really fast and you can knock out a bunch of these paintings relatively easy. Now, just for expediency purposes, I'm not gonna paint the entire rows because um, I would be here for probably the whole hour. I wanna get to those layers, the, the layers of color that makes it look like the light is hitting this other than it's just a kind of a rose petal shape coming out of the blackness. <laughs> so I'm gonna go back to that, uh, this is my 12 brush, right? And I'm gonna use this poppy red. So at first we started with the aubergine. It's this lovely dark purple kind of color. And now I'm going in with poppy red. I'm going straight in with poppy red. I'm not mixing it. That's all it is. I'm doing the same thing where I'm breaking it down with a little bit of water. And that's all that's on my brush, right? And now I'm gonna do the same exact thing that I just did only I'm gonna break down those leaf petal shapes into where the light is hitting it. So um, here, let me grab this again, put this off to the side so I don't mess this up, right? So that I have that leaf shape, right? Or even actually, let me do it down here. So the whole leaf shape is all the way down here. But you see where that shadow kind of comes in? I'm gonna leave that part purple. So I might actually just kind of come in where the light is hitting it and do just this portion of it. Right? I might do just that portion in that poppy red so it now looks like I have light hitting my rose petals. And again, you can get as intricate as you want because I can also see there's a little bit of a shadow here right where that petal kind of dips in just a little bit, and if I wanted to put that in, I could, something like that, right? You can get as intricate as you want to, but let's grab this again and grab my brush that is loaded up with the poppy, and let's start putting in a little bit of light. So again, I'm gonna start in the center and work my way out. Let's make sure that this actually is on camera for you guys to see. All right, so right in the center, again, I'm using this as reference just loosely. The, the petals, right where they stick out just out of the center, it's being just barely touched with light. So I'm going to just go in 
just a little bit, just along that edge. And this is why I love the Filbert brush because I can get a really fine line with that brush if I use just that edge. Um, I can also get a pretty big, thick, chunky section of paint if I need to. Um, now this one, maybe it goes up and over and then I'm gonna cut it back down right here. Like that. To where it now looks like this is this side of the rose and that is the opposite side. So now I've made the rose petal just slightly turn, right? And I can also adjust the shape of that petal just a little bit. And especially with these like finer little inner petals, that's where you might even wanna go down to a four if you're having a hard time getting those big shapes with a larger brush. Use whatever works for you guys, you know? Then, there we go. So you see, it looks like it's starting to get hit by light. Now, again, if you guys have any questions while I'm doing this, feel free to ask. My moderators will be happy to ask anything. I think we've mostly just been mesmerized watching it dry <laughs> and get lighter. Isn't that awesome? It is, it's so incredibly pigmented and you do a quick little wash and you're just like, eh, it's pretty dark and then you let it dry and you're like, whoa, there's a petal there. <laughs> and it's a perfectly, perfect example of why you need to swatch. Yes. yes. This is why you swatch your paints, absolutely. Uh, and this is why I also uh, tend to have a black line on any of my swatch cards. I wish I had them with me. I don't have, oh, I do have a couple over there. Uh, they're in oils, but I can show you guys. If you wanna grab me one of those, <laughs> um, I'll show you a swatch card. And this is why I do this, uh, because even the difference of what it looks like on black or white, thank you. Um, here we go. So I was swatching this is oil paint, so it's slightly different, but you see I have a black line down the middle. That's because the way that this paint looks on black and the way that it looks on white is vastly different most of the time. Um, and you can see it's also for opacity. This top part is the straight paint right out of the tube. This is called mass tone. This is with nothing mixed in at all. Uh, this right here is a glaze, which is more apt for like oils and things like that, uh, especially with acrylics, because then you can see the undertones. And uh, I mean, the opacity of that is not that important, but you can also see how it affects that solid black as well. Down here is the tint where I mix it with uh, like a 50-50 with white, uh, just to kind of see the, again, the undertones a little bit more and kind of see what my paint will do. Um, but Turner Crow Wash is very different from oil paints, and this is why it's definitely important to do that. Do we have a question? Would this particular painting technique work with standard acrylic paints? Yes. That was the other thing, uh, and I forgot to mention this with Katie. You can do this with oils. You can do it with acrylics. You can do it with this uh, acrylic gouache. Uh, you can also do this with gouache. Uh, just be aware that traditional gouache and there's a whole show that goes over what gouache is and all the different types of gouache that we have um, and that gets more in depth so I'm not really going to worry about all of that but gouache is opaque but it will reactivate. This one does not reactivate. This is why I like this so much for this painting technique because it's very opaque and it will not move on you when you do your layers like this. But just oils, you might want to let it dry a little bit longer. <laughs> uh, acrylics, again, it dries relatively quick just like this does. Um, and here's the other cool thing with this is if you knock off, here, let me kind of pull this. I'm knocking off the majority of the paint off of my brush, right? So if I wanted to do this as a dry brush and get kind of a dry brushy effect, just to kind of have it kind of almost fade from one color to the other. You can do that too. Um, here, maybe I'll do this a little bit over here. Right? 
Now the other cool thing is that if you wanted to mix your colors together for these in-between stages, you can take that and mix it with that and you can get that transition color if you wanna mix. But if you are just starting out and you're having a hard time getting those color mixes, this is a really easy way of doing that without having to worry about it. So I'm not going to do that. I'm gonna stick with the pure colors. And you can really just pick any four reds as long yep. as you have a different value. Or that you was could even like switch it up and do it in a different color if you have yep. the four values, right? Absolutely. Uh, and that's the cool thing is that you can, again, break this down into as many steps as you want to. You can use two colors. This is pretty effective in just the two colors alone, well, with the background. I, I'm minusing the background. Um, but then you can also alter your entire image by changing that background color. If I used a bright yellow as my base, and then I started doing the same colors on top of that, it would have a very different feel from what this is. And then it would also, those colors again, would interact with your base color very differently than what it is on the black. So again, swatch your colors, especially if you're gonna have a different, you know, base tone. Uh, but you could also do this like this one. I was honestly going to do this painting on a protone. There's a, a green, like a seafoam green panel that we have. And I was gonna do this on the seafoam green and then just let it be. Um, but I decided just to break it down into regular shapes. This would probably be a lot easier for you guys to see just the whole process. So let's put in a couple more of those highlights before I keep jabbering on because I wanted to show you the next couple colors and how they, they layer on top of each other and then also still affect your painting. So again, I'm kind of dry brushing. And for anybody who doesn't know what dry brushing is, that's getting the majority of the paint off your brush to where it's almost in between that like wet and dry stage to where as you brush it down, you get, let me get this real close here. You get the brush marks and you can kind of see it almost float off just like that. Um, that's a really fun way of optically mixing your colors, which means the two colors are kind of scattered uh, in between each other like this and you can see them together. So your eye mixes them and it makes it look like a transition color when you're not actually painting a transition color. Yay for science. <laughs> now this one now I think I actually want a little bit more of a pointy edge here I want to kind of turn over a little bit and I can alter the shape of my petal and again if I did this and I hated that I could come back in with the black and just erase it back out it's very forgiving process And then I'll do the last few petals that I have down here so you guys can really see it. I can even take my brush here and kind of drag it up just a little bit just to get that edge kind of feathered in if I need to. But I can get very fine lines. That's This is why I love a filbert. Love it. All right. This came up in the chat earlier, but can you explain the difference between a filbert and a cat's tongue? Ah, that is a very good question. Now, sometimes it's a little confusing with uh, the difference between a filbert and a cat's tongue. And I'm gonna try and do this while I actually continue to paint. A filbert, you can see the, let me not have it squished. You can see the shape of a filbert. It is very round in the end, right? It goes perfectly round, right? A cat's tongue should come to a point. Now, that means even after you get it wet and you clean it, it should still have that point, right? Excuse my paint on my hand. Uh, sometimes, and this is uh, 
part of my job. Sometimes uh, we'll have brushes and they're called a cat's tongue, but as soon as you get them wet, they turn into a filbert. That's not a traditional cat's tongue. Um, a cat's tongue should continue to have that point. So it should be very similar to the shape, but it should come together like a cat's tongue, just as you would think, right? Let's think of them like Hershey Kisses. Yeah, like a Hershey Kiss. That shape. Yep. Although anytime I hear cat's tongue, it always reminds me of my brother and my sister-in-law's old cat, who, if this cat liked you, would give you kisses with its under tongue. Yeah, like, just the underside of its tongue, which was the weirdest thing, because cat's tongues are, like, really rough. Not the underside. It is very unnerving. So, Mr. Potts. That was his name. He had a very large head. <laughs> it was the weirdest thing ever. All right. I was going to say, I, I don't know if we have any of them. Looking. Katie, Katie's looking to see if we can show you an example of a cat's tongue. But I don't think we have any specifically in the studio, which is ironic because I think I have one in my office. But I'm not entirely sure. So I'm going to do just a little bit. Yeah, I was going to say, I really don't. That's not a brush we get in here very often. It's very specific. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going up to the edge of where I had originally painted that. So where it looks like the light's hitting that petal, but then the petal is also now turning down back into space. And that's the kind of fun little details where you can really see where if it's turning back down, you can leave that purple and it just automatically, your eye understands what's happening there, which is super fun. This is really like a great way to study light hitting forms, to be honest. Even if you're not trying to paint roses, this is a really, really great way to kind of, I guess, examine light hitting things. Right? Now, as you can see, it's still a little patchy. If I wanted to go in there and make that a solid color, I can. I'm not too worried about it because I'm still going to put layers on top of that, right? All right, and again, remember, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. But I'm pretty sure in the comments, it's all like, ooh, ah. All right, so let me actually leave these here. So aubergine, poppy red, that's the only two colors we've used so far. Now I'm going to go in with a cadmium red light hue. And the difference between all of these is that this is that purpley red, that aubergine. The poppy red is like a nice, true, like, Oh, let me not knock that over. Uh, it's like a true, like, kind of just reminds me of like a fire engine red. It's just real red, you know? And then that cadmium is almost lending a little bit towards the orangey side. So as you can see, we're getting a little bit lighter and we're getting a little bit more on that yellowy side of the reds as we go along. So here, let me show you what it looks like straight out of the tube. Here you can see there's that poppy red and there's the cadmium red. So it's got a little bit more orange to it. And again, we are going straight in. Let me actually get all these brushes out of my way here. I'm sorry. I'm going to put them in here. I'm getting, I'm getting a pile of brushes that are precariously in my water bucket. and I don't want to have them knock over. Because again, I am a mess sometimes and that's okay. But let's not do that on camera. All right, there you guys can see that. So again, it's just water and the paint. I am just breaking it down a little bit just so I can get a nice wash. And it's still massively pigmented. Now, depending on your reference and depending on how brightly lit you want the center of your rose, I would probably just, if I was trying to do this one, exactly as my reference, I would probably leave this as is and I probably wouldn't touch any more of this color in. But I want emphasis on the center of that rose. I want it to look like the light's hitting that and then going down. So we're artists, we have the ability to alter the way that things look and the way that they are perceived. So let me actually get a little bit less of this paint on here. 
I'm going to, again, do the exact same thing, but I'm going to leave the majority of the two colors that I already have down. I'm going to leave them be, and I'm just going to touch this only where I had the poppy red. You see that? I'm not putting this crazy orangey red touching that purple. So I'm building up my layers almost like Legos. So we have our base is that purple where it's kind of in shadow. The next layer is the poppy red. The next layer is the cadmium red light. And then the, the final one will be coral red. But I don't let my other, my lighter colors hit the darker one unless it makes sense with your reference. Because again, I say that and you can ultimately find a photo reference where it does that. But just, you really want to kind of just look. So a lot of it is right here, right here, just on the, the very ends of those flowers. But it doesn't go from that crazy purple to this brighter color. Do you have a question? Yes. Um, I don't know if you said this when you were talking about the cat's tongue before, but Sherry Susan is wondering if there yeah. was any special technique that you would use that br kind of brush for, or like what's the tr the real draw for it? I think I feel like floral artists use them a lot. Yeah, because it's it's almost in the shape of a petal mm -hmm. to begin with, and that's I guess also why I chose filberts specifically for this class. Because if you wanted to get petal shapes, you can get them very easily with these brushes. Um, it's, I always get very hesitant to answer those questions because it's all personal preference. If maybe you really like lettering with it, I mean, it might do something really, really incredible for very funky lettering if that's what you do. It's all experimentation in what these brushes can achieve for you as an artist, and it's all personal. Like I said, the, the filbert is my personal preference. Uh, some other people really love round brushes, and that's where everyone does brush strokes in a very unique, interesting way. And that's why I would suggest getting a variety of brushes and seeing which ones work best for you. But Ultimately, the cat's tongue, I, I would say it's really meant for florals. Wow. Is is kind of like the standard traditional use of it, but you don't have to. We're artists. We're meant to break the rules, you know? That's funny. That's been the topic right here for the past couple of days. Breaking rules. <laughs> breaking rules. Not breaking rules in general, but appropriate uses for brush shapes. Mm. Yeah. And We've been talking about a lot. kind of like, I, I just use what works. Yeah. What works for me, but what works for you doesn't necessarily work for somebody else. Yep. Or for their medium, or... It's a hard question to answer. <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very, that's, hits the discussion for the past couple of days. Yeah. So as you can see, that uh, more orangey kind of red hitting that makes it look like the light is hitting this a little bit more. So the reason why I go kind of more towards the orangey reds for the light is because, typically speaking, in color theory, um, your shadows are going to be on the purple side and your lights are going to be more towards those warmer yellowy tones. The reason why is because 9 times out of 10, your light is sunshine and that light is very yellow. So when the light hits a red rose, that yellow light interacts with that color. So it's the color of your light plus the color of the object, and that's the color of where the light is hitting, if that makes any sense. And the shadows tend to be on the opposite side of the color wheel. So if your light's a yellow light, your shadows tend to be purple. Now, I actually put a little too much of that paint on there. It's getting a little, oh. That's why I have a, I have a dry paint booger. Excuse me. I probably worked a little too fast on here. I you really want to let those layers really dry in between, and they dry relatively quick, but I definitely did not let that dry very well. Um, but as you can see, 
again, I'm not mixing. I'm just putting layers and layers and layers on top of layers and layers and layers. So as you build up your layers, they're going to alter the way that this kind of almost emerges out of your black canvas, which is the coolest thing and makes me so happy. Are you using a, you're using a super light touch when you're painting, right? Very light touch. I am not scrubbing. I am not jamming it down. Um, for the most part, when I do paint, I usually let the paintbrush kind of do the work and I'll touch it. And if I really want to get like, especially at the first stage where I'm kind of creating the forms of my, my uh, flowers, is that I will start with a very light touch and I might add more pressure just to get kind of more of that brush contact with the, the canvas. But after that, it's really just like, I let it kind of drag almost horizontally on the surface, if that makes any sense. And that's pretty typical for how I paint. Um, I tend to very lightly touch things and I have uh, usually pretty opaque paint on my brush because uh, I like to do a lot of this optical mixing to where your eye tells you what's happening. But then if you actually really look at the form, I'm not doing much mixing at all. <laughs> for the most part, I, I really don't do a whole lot of mixing or blending. You can if you want to. Um, but that's just something I don't really do. I like doing this graphic-y kind of a thing. Can you use uh, acrylic gouache in conjunction with traditional acrylics? Or would you kind of keep them separate? You can. You can mix anything you want, really. Um, but just be aware that acrylic gouache is a flat matte surface. Acrylics tend to have some kind of a glossy sheen to it. So the colors might be exactly what you want it to be. The sheen is not going to match. And that's where you might get something that is either accidentally not great or accidentally wonderful. You might really love it. Like if I were to put um, little water droplets on there and I were to use acrylic, it would look shiny. And those water droplets would then look wet even after it's dry. But I could put the acrylic on top of here, no problem, if that's what the question was. But just be aware of the sheen difference. That's going to be a thing. All right, and then the last color, though, is coral red. Now, again, you can stop here. You can be done. I'm just going to push it a little bit further because that's honestly what I did here. <laughs> you can see that's where I just touched it in, just a little bit here and there. Uh, this right here, you don't need a whole lot. And again, if you wanted to mix the two colors together to get that transition color in between and then do your coral red as another layer, you can. Um, again, I'm not mixing. I'm just leaving them completely as is. And I love this color so much. It's very coral red. It's like a, like a salmon-y color, you know? Here, let me keep those. Again, this is the, the order that they went in. So aubergine, poppy red, cadmium red light hue, and then that coral red. Again, just a little bit of water. And actually, this is usually where I would use that tiny, tiny little brush because I don't want a whole lot on here. But I just loaded up my paintbrush and I don't want to waste this. <laughs> Instead so. of the water, could you use a matte medium? Matte medium in the Turner Acryl Gouache is technically making your acrylic gouache more into an acrylic than what it actually is. So you would then be putting in an acrylic polymer into this paint so it would act a little differently. Yes, yes, you absolutely can do that. I can't attest to what that would do to your paint. Um, but it would be something that you could experiment with. I mean, that might be the, the coolest thing ever. I just have never done it. <laughs> How do you feel about scumbling? Scumbling? When it is an appropriate time to scumble, scumble your heart out. <laughs> when would that be? Um, it depends on your own personal profit, uh, process with your art, what medium you're using. I just, it. If you like to
to do that with watercolors, you can. If you want to uh, really do that with um, acrylics, you can. I mean, it. whenever it feels right, you know? But these are the last few touches here, just to kind of make it look like it has a little bit of a highlight, because I like that little bit of highlight. It honestly changes everything. Doesn't it? Yeah. Just a slight highlight. And again, I'm doing a highlight with crazy coral red. It's not white. You don't have to have pure white paint for a highlight. But it reads like it. Exactly. Because it is lighter in value. And that's why your eye goes, that's a highlight. Because it just makes sense, right? So let me do just a little bit more. And then I will show you a magic trick. I mean, I don't know about you guys, if you like magic, but ta-da, we have a rose. <laughs> that wasn't, the, that's not the trick, okay. by the way. Um, so, but that's the layering process. And I mean, you can build up your whole entire canvas with this, and then you can have a full rose. And this right here, again, I use this reference as kind of like a, a jumping off point, but as you can see, they don't look the same. Like, that rose is not that rose. They could be similar, but they're not the same. And I mean, as many times as I can paint this, I will probably end up with a different looking rose every time. Uh, I also, for this one, uh, I believe the petals that I added up here were fake. They were not in the reference. I added them in because I was like, I need more petals up here because uh, it was missing. But magic trick. So the cool thing with a couple of these paints that I used, specifically the aubergine and the poppy red, is that they glow. I don't know if that's very visible. I hope it is. Uh, some of them are fluorescent. <laughs> Uh, so if you actually end up using, like instead of the coral red, if you ended up using a more fluorescent color, uh, <laughs> then you could also have your highlights glow even more. There is a fluorescent white that you could mix into your paint to just kind of tint it into that more pink realm, but that would also glow. Do we have a question? Do you use a cat's tongue brush the same way you use a filter? Filbert. <laughs> Filbert. Um, again, it's all personal preference. I don't use cat tongues because they're not my personal preference. You can use them the same way. Uh, Cause if you were to, cause the, let me see if I can find one. You can use any brush the same way. Yeah, I mean, you can use, you can use a flat brush the same exact way. Um, but with a cat's tongue, when you have them uh, nice and, and properly, like if you don't scumble with your brush and destroy your brush and they still have a nice shape to them, if you turn it sideways, it's still gonna have that really fine, kind of almost point looking type thing. So then you can absolutely use it just like a liner if you needed it to. Uh, but you have to really practice your brush strokes and really work on that really delicate fine touch to get it to do what you're looking for it to do, I guess. But that was painting roses. Uh, one last uh, question and answers if you guys have them before I officially jump off of here. I hope you guys enjoyed that. And that's, I mean, hopefully you guys can really see uh, even just a different camera. Like it's, it's insane how well these, uh, these colors really jump off that black, but it's just, it's so fun. And like I said, I'm gonna be painting a dozen of these and that's my dozen roses for Valentine's Day. And again, cough, cough, hint, hint, Valentine's Day is next week. In case you didn't get anything for your significant other, <laughs> paint them some roses. And it's a rose that never dies. So, uh, and plus, I mean, it's also blacklight activated. <laughs> so, super fun. Um, but, I mean, it's, it's a fun process. And even if you don't give this to anybody else, it, maybe I'm going to paint myself 12 roses. You know, I can paint this for me or you can paint it for you because self-love is also important and uh, you can gift it to yourself. But 
One last call for questions before I jump off of here. Oh, will you varnish that? Will I varnish this? Um, no. Because the acrylic gouache is pretty solid as it is, uh, and it's not going to move on me, like, it, it does not reactivate like a traditional gouache, so I wouldn't need to varnish it. If I do varnish it, you're going to change that sheen. Like, this is flat matte. I love the fact that it's flat matte. If you put anything on here, it might change the way that the black looks, and it just, it wouldn't be quite the same. I feel like we've done it very carefully. Yeah. With a matte varnish a matte varnish and i would maybe even do like a spray it was a spray varnish because you could do a matte. really light layer really light really, really small light. yes really light and it was just for protection not for mm -hmm. yeah um but that would be the only thing i would really do if i were to varnish this but that would be if i knew it was going to be in a position where it was going to get pretty beat up but for the most part, no. <laughs> Any other questions though, before I jump off of here? All right, well, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope you painted along with me. And if you did, I would love to see what you did. Please post it to our Jerry's Live Facebook group. So it is free to join. All you have to do is answer that one security question because if you don't, you'll be deemed a robot and not allowed in. I've tried to talk them into letting you in robots, but no. So make sure you answer the security question and then you guys can post whatever it is that you've painted. Uh, and besides roses, you can also just post your normal everyday art because it is a group of, uh, there's over 6,000 people in there now and we're all artists and we are all there to support each other and enjoy everyone's, you know, creations. It's really fun. If they do the roses, make sure they hashtag it with the JL228 so you can find it. Yes, please do that. Even if you post it on Instagram, uh, you can tag me, MissCakes.art, uh, or you can also follow me on there because I do a lot of these back, the, the things that I do for my job, you also see a lot of posts on there, which I just posted a rhino. Stay tuned for the rhino. <laughs> but if you do post it either on Instagram or Facebook, make sure to use the tag uh, the hashtag JL228 so we can search it and find it. Uh, also, if you really, really don't want to post it for the public to see, you can direct message me and I would love to see what you guys make. It would be wonderful. But that was everything. I hope you guys have a wonderful Valentine's Day and day in general. Just have a great day. Bye!